Okay, pneumonia, Iggy, 659 to 666. Pneumonia, pathophysiology. Pneumonia is an excess of fluid in the lungs resulting from an inflammatory process. The, inflammatory, the inflammation is triggered by many infectious organisms and by inhalation of irritating agents. Infectious pneumonias are categorized as either community-acquired, or CAP, or hospital-acquired, nos nosocomial, um, known as HAP, or HAI, HAI, uh, depending on where the patient was exposed to the infectious agent. This distinction is important because hospital-acquired pneumonias are more likely to be, to be resistant to some antibiotics than are CAPs. The inflammation occurs in the interstitial spaces, the alveoli, and often the bronchioles. The process begins when organisms penetrate the airway mucosa and multiply in alveolar sacs. Thank you. Or in multiply in alveolar spaces. To do this, they must survive the lungs' many defenses against microbial invasion, including the inflammatory response. White blood cells migrate to the area of infection, causing local capillary leak, edema, and exudate. These fluids collect in and around the alveoli, and the alveolar walls thicken. Both events seriously reduce gas exchange and lead to hypoxemia, interfering with oxygenation and tissue perfusion and can lead to death. Red blood cells and fibrin also move into the alveoli. The capillary leak spreads the infection to other areas of the lung. If the organisms move into the bloodstream, sepsis results. If the infection extends into the pleural cavity, Empyema results. The fibrin and edema of inflammation stiffen the lung, reducing compliance and decreasing the vital capacity. Alveolar collapse or, or atelectasis. I know that's not the right pronunciation, uh, but uh, atelectasis. Uh, further reduces the ability of the lungs to oxygenate the blood moving through it. As a result, art arterial oxygen tension falls, causing hypoxemia, or insufficient oxygen in the blood, and reduced oxygenation and tissue perfusion. Pneumonia may occur as lobar pneumonia with consolidation or solidification of air spaces, in a segment or an entire lobe of the lung or as bronchopneumonia with diffusely scattered patches around the bronchi. The extent of lung involvement after the organism invades depends on the host defenses. Bacteria multiply quickly in a person whose immune system is compromised. Tissue necrosis results when organisms form an abscess that perforates the bronchial wall, or, yeah, bronchial wall. Etiology. <coughs> In general, people develop pneumonia when their immune systems cannot combat the, the virulence of the invading organisms. Organisms from the environment, invasive devices, equipment and supplies, staff, or other people can invade the body. Uh, risk factors are listed in Table 32, 32. Pneumonia can be caused by bacteria, viruses, mycoplasms, fungi, rickettsii, protozoa, and helminths or worms. Non-infectious causes of pneumonia include inhalation of toxic gases, um, chemicals, and smoke and aspiration of water, food, fluid, and vomitus. Incidence slash prevalence. In the United States, two to five million cases of pneumonia occur each year. 
and it is the seventh leading cause of death. The highest incidence among adults occurs in older adults, nursing home residents, hospitalized patients, and those being mechanically ventilated. Community-acquired pneumonia, or CAP, is more common than hospital-acquired pneumonia and occurs in late fall and winter as a complication of influenza. Hospital-acquired pneumonia, HAP, is a common nosocomial infection, one that is acquired as a result of transmission during a hospital say, stay. A specific type of HAP is ventilator-associated pneumonia, or VAP. HAP has a 20% to 50% mortality rate. The highest incidence is in those patients infected with uh, Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, uh, Acinetobacter. Uh, other high-risk organisms or secondary bacterium. The mortality rate also is higher in patients who have severe hy hypoxemia arterial gas lower than 80 mmHg, and in those who develop excuse me, widespread atelectasis, um, pleural effusion, or ventil ventilatory failure. Table 33-2. Okay. Table 33-2, risk factors of pneumonia. Community acquired pneumonias uh, is an older adult. These are risk factors. Uh, is an older adult has never received the pneumococcal vaccine or received it more than six years ago. Did not receive the influenza vaccine in the previous year. Has a chronic health problem or other coexisting condition. Has recently been exposed to respiratory, viral, or influenza infections. Uses tobacco or alcohol. Hospital-acquired pneumonias is an older adult, has chronic lung disease, has presence of gram-negative colonization of the mouth, throat, and stomach, has an altered level of consciousness, has had a recent aspiration event, has presence of endotracheal tracheostomy or tuba nasogastric, uh, um, has poor nutritional status, has immune, immunocompromised status from disease or drug therapy, uses drugs that increase gastric pH, histamine, H2 blockers, antacids, uh, for example, or alkaline tube feedings, is currently receiving mechanical ventilation, ventilator-acquired pneumonia, VAP. Health promotion and maintenance of the different types of pneumonia organisms, the most common are 6B, 23F, 14, 9V, 19A, and 19F. All these types, plus 17, others are included in the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, or PPV23. Patient education is important in the prevention of pneumonia, chart 33-4, especially encouraging everyone older than 65 and those who have a chronic health problem to receive the PPV23. This vaccine is usually given once, however, however some experts believe that older adults and those with chronic health problems could benefit from a second vaccination if more than five years have passed since the first vaccination. Other prevention techniques include strict hand washing, to avoid the spread of organisms and avoiding large gatherings of people during cold and flu season. Teach the patient who has a cold or the flu to see his or her health care provider if fever lasts more than 24 hours, if the problem lasts longer than one week, or if symptoms worsen. Hospital respiratory therapy equipment should be well maintained and decontaminated or changed as recommended. Use sterile water rather than tap water in GI tubes and inst institute aspiration precautions as indicated. Specific interventions to prevent aspiration are discussed in Chapter 31. VAP is on the rise, especially among patients with endotracheal tubes in place for mechanical ventilation. Although just having the tube providing a direct connection between the environment and the patient's lower respiratory passageways increases uh, the risk for VAP. The risk can be reduced with conscientious assessment and meticulous nursing care. 
Prevention activities can help meet uh, the Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goal 7. Three care actions, known as a ventilator bundle, have been shown to reduce the incidence of VAP, hand hygiene, oral care, and head of bed evaluation. I'm sorry, head of bed elevation. Oral care, in particular, can help reduce the risk because many of the most common organisms <coughs> me, causing VAP are translocated from the patient's mouth into the respiratory tract. Chart 33.4, Patients and Family Education Guide, Preventing Pneumonia. Know whether you are at risk for pneumonia. Older than 65 years have a chronic health problem, uh, especially a respiratory problem, or have limited mobility and are confined to a bed or chair during your waking hours. Have the annual influenza vaccine after discussing appropriate timing of the vaccination with your primary health care provider. Discuss the pneumococcal vaccine with your primary health care provider and have the vaccination as recommended. Avoid crowded public areas during flu and holiday seasons. If you have a mobility problem, cough, turn, move about as much as possible, and perform deep breathing exercises. If you are using respiration equipment at home, clean the equipment as you have been taught. Avoid indoor pollutants such as dust, secondhand or passive smoke, and aerosols. If you do not smoke, don't start. <laughs> If you smoke, seek professional help on how to stop, or at least decrease your habit. Be sure to get enough rest and sleep on a daily basis. Uh, eat a healthy, balanced diet. Drink at least 3 liters of non-alcoholic fluids each day, unless fluid restrictions are needed because of another health problem. NCLEX Examination Challenge the nurse is providing care to a client who is receiving mechanical ventilation. Which nursing action should be implemented to prevent VAP for this client? A. Providing oral care every 8 hours. B. Positioning the client on his or her side. C. Ensuring oxygen delivered as is humidified. D. Verifying that the client has received the pneumococcal vaccination. Probably A. The oral care because they just said that. Uh, Patient-centered collaborative care. The concept map on page 662 addresses assessment and nursing care issues related to patients who have pneumonia. The manifestations of pneumonia differ in older patients compared with younger patients. Assessment History When assessing a patient who may have pneumonia, consider the risk factors for infection. See Table 33.2. Obtain the information from a family member if the patient is confused or too dyspneic. Um... Document age, living, work, a, document age, uh, living, work, or school environment, diet, exercise, and sleep routines, swallowing problems, presence of nasogastrointestinal tube, tobacco and alcohol use, past and current use of street drugs, and history of drug addiction and injection drug use. Ask the patient about past respiratory illnesses and whether he or she has been exposed to influenza or pneumonia or has had a recent viral infection. Ask about recent skin rashes, insect bites, and exposure to animals. Chart 335. Best practice for patient safety and quality care. Preventing ventilator-associated pneumonia or VAP. If possible, perform oral care with a disinfecting oral rinse right before the intubation. Do not wear hand jewelry, especially rings, when providing care to ventilator patients. Wash hands before and after contact with the patient. Provide complete oral care at least every 12 hours. Remove subglottic secretions frequently at least every 2 hours or continuously when the end endotracheal tube has a separate lumen that opens directly above the tube cuff. So let's remove subglottal secretions, okay? Uh, keep the head of the bed elevated to at least 30 degrees, unless another health problem is a contraindication for this position. Verify that an initial x-ray has been obtained to confirm the placement of any nasogastric tube before instilling drugs, fluids, or feedings into the tube. Avoid turning the patient or placing him or her in the supine position, even briefly. Within an hour after 
a bolus tube feeding. Work with the patient and healthcare team to assist in the weaning process as soon as possible. See page or see chapter thirty four. If the patient excuse me, if the patient has a chronic has chronic respiratory problems, ask whether respiratory equipment is used in the home. Assess whether the patient's home cleaning level is adequate to prevent infection. Ask him or her when the last influenza or pneumococcal vaccine was received. Physical assessment, clinical manifestations. First observe the general appearance. Many patients with pneumonia have flushed cheeks, bright eyes, and an anxious expression. The patient may have ch chest or pleuritic pain or discomfort, myalgia, headache, chills, fever, cough, tachycardia, dyspnea, tachyp tachypnea, and sputum production. Severe chest muscle weakness also may be present from st sustained coughing. Observe the patient's breathing pattern, position, and use of accessory muscles. The hypoxic patient may be uncomfortable in a lying position and will sit upright, balancing with, his, with the hands. Assess the cough and the amount, color, consistency, and odor of sputum produced. Crackles are heard with an auscultation, uh, with auscultation when fluid is in interstitial and alveolar areas. Wheezing may be heard as a result of inflammation and exudate in airways. Bronchial breath sounds are heard over areas of density or consolidation. Uh, tactile phrenitis is increased over areas of pneumonia and percussion is dulled in these areas. Chest expansion may be diminished or unequal on inspiration. In evaluating vital signs, compare the results with baseline values. The patient with pneumonia is likely to be hypotensive with orthostatic changes as a result of vasodilation and dehydration, especially older adults. A rapid, weak pulse may indicate hypoxemia, dehydration, and impending shock. Dysrhythmias may be present as a result of cardiac tissue hypoxia. Common pneumonia manifestations and their causes are listed in Table 33.3. Considerations for older adults. The older adult with pneumonia often has weakness, fatigue, lethargy, confusion, and poor appetite. Fever and cough may be absent, but hypoxemia is usually present. The most common manifestation of pneumonia is the in the older adult patient is acute confusion with hypoxia rather than fever or cough. Psychosocial assessment. The patient with pneumonia often has pain, fatigue, and dyspnea, all of which promote anxiety. Assess anxiety by looking at his or her facial expression and general tenseness of facial and shoulder muscles. Listen to him or her carefully and use a calm, slow approach to assessment. Because of airway obstruction and f muscle fatigue, the patient with dyspnea speaks in broken sentences. Keep the interview short if significant dyspnea or breathing discomfort is present. Evidence-based practice. Don't neglect basic oral care to prevent VAP. Ventilator-associated pneumonia VAP is a serious hospital-acquired infection that results in longer patient stays and significant mortality rates in acute care settings. Prevention of this complication is the focus of the Joint Com Commission National Patient Safety Goal 7, Prevention of Health Care Associated Infections. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has developed the ventilator bundle ap approach of interventions to prevent VAP. The purpose of the study described in this article, described in this article was to examine the use of the bundle of nurses 
uh, to examine the use of the bundle by nurses before and after an educational intervention. However, its meta-analysis performed on 19 research articles regarding the effectiveness of individual bundle activities on the prevention of VAP is of particular port importance in ensuring the use of evidence-based practices. The ventilator bundle for prevention of VAP recommended by the CDC consists of elevating the head of the bed to between 30 and 45 degrees whenever possible, continuously removing subglottic secretions, changing the ventilator circuit no more frequently than every 48 hours, hand washing before and after contact with e each patient, critical review of research for each action and other factors contributing to VAP development demonstrated that these interventions are effective in preventing VAP when performed in association with the additional modifications or interventions. So um, to go along with that, not wearing hand jewelry, rings when caring, when caring for ventilator patients, performing meticulous oral care no less than every 12 hours. Level of Evidence 1. The study provides a meta-analysis of relevant randomized controlled clinical trials. Uh, commentary. Implications for practice and research. Most of the activities recommended by the CDC for prevention of VAP are cost-effective, safe, and feasible. The addition of oral care and uh, not wearing hand jewelry when caring for ventilator patients is also cost-effective, safe, and feasible. The evidence of infections from translocation of mouth organisms to the respiratory tract in particular overwhelmingly supports the need for meticulous oral care. An area often neglected when caring for seriously ill patients. Educating nurses and other care providers in the proper method of providing adequate oral care to patients who are being mechanically ventilated and who may not be alert is essential in preventing VAP. Okay, then there's a concept mapped map of uh, bacterial pneumonia. Okay. Laboratory assessment. Sputum is obtained and examined by gram stain, culture, and sensitivity testing. However, the responsible organism often is not identified. A sputum sample is easily obtained from this patient who can cough into a specimen container. Extremely ill patients may need suctioning to obtain a sputum specimen. In these uh, situations, a specimen is, is obtained by sputum trap uh, during suctioning. A CBC is obtained to identify leukocytosis and elevated white blood cell count, uh, which is a common finding except in older uh, adults. Blood cultures may be performed to determine whether the organism has invaded the blood. An HIV test may be performed. Urine may be examined for blood, pus, or protein, which may occur in the septic patient with pneumonia. Table 33.3, Pathophysiology of Common Clinical Manifestations of Pneumonia. Uh, okay, clinical manifestation, increased respiratory rate, dyspnea, pathophys on that would be stimulation of chemoreceptors, um, increased work of breathing as a result of decreased lung compliance, simulation of J receptors, stimulation of J receptors. Anxiety, pain. Uh, then uh, another manifestation would be hypoxemia. Uh, pathophys would be alveolar con consolidation, uh, pulmonary capillary shunting, uh, cough. It would be fluid accumulation 
in the receptors of the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles. Prurulent, blood-tinged, or rust-colored sputum is a result of the inflammatory process in which the fluid from the pulmonary capillaries uh, and red blood cells move into the alveoli. Fever. Uh, phagocytes uh, release pyrogens that cause the hypothalamus to increase body temperature. And then pleuritic chest discomfort. And that'd be inflammation of the parietal pleura causes pain on inspiration. Figure 33.1 is a picture of an argyle specimen trap for mucus collection. It has a suction from uh, a tube at the end and it connects to section source and goes into a little specimen jar. In, severe, in severely ill patients, ABGs may be performed to determine baseline arterial oxygen and carbon dioxide levels and help identify a need for supplemental oxygen. Serum, electrolyte, blood, and urea nitrogen, bun, and creatinine levels also are assessed. A high bun level may occur as a result of dehydration. Uh, hype, hyper, hype, uh, hypometrema, matremia, not neutrema, matremia, um, high blood sodium levels. Oh no, it says hypernatremia. <laughs> uh, misprint. High blood sodium levels occurs with dehydration as a result of fever and decreased fluid intake. Imaging assistant assessment. Imaging assessment. Chest x-ray continues to be the most common diagnostic test for pneumonia, but may not show changes until two or more days after manifestations are present. It usually appears on chest x-ray uh, as an area of increased density. It may involve a lung segment, a lobe, one lung, or both lungs. In the older adult, the chest x-ray is essential for early diagnosis of pneumonia because symptoms are often vague. Other diagnostic assessment. Pulse oximetry is used to assess for hypoxemia. Um, more invasive tests may be needed, such as transtracheal aspiration, bronchoscopy, or direct needle aspiration of the, the lung to obtain lower airway specimens. Thor Thoracentesis is most often used in patients who have an accompanying, accompanying uh, pleural effusion. Des decision making challenge delegation slash supervision. The patient is an 82 year old woman with pneumonia who was admitted through the ED. His wife says that he has had a cold for about a week and has been taking over-the-counter cough suppressants. This morning, he said he was too tired to eat breakfast. The wife went to the grocery store, and when she returned, she found the patient in his pajamas trying to clean the street in front of their home with a vacuum cleaner. When she asked him to come in the house, he did not know which house was his. His admitting viral si vital signs are temperature 97.6, 97 uh, pulse 116, irregular and thready, resps 24 and shallow, and BP 100 over 56. Pulse oximetry is 88%. He is now on your unit. 1. Which person should be assigned to his care today? The UAP, the experienced LPN, or the RN, who is newly licensed? Pr provide a ration rationale for your choice. 
What actions should be taught or stressed to the person assigned to the care for this patient? The admitting orders are Rosefin 2 grams IV, piggyback stat, then 1 gram every 12 hours, oxygen at 5 liters by nasal cannula, vital signs hourly, and 500 milliliters saline uh, IV bolus stat. What should be performed first and by whom? Provide a rationale for this choice. Analysis. Common nursing diagnoses and collaborative problems. Priority nursing diagnoses for patients with pneumonia are 1. Impaired gas exchange related to efforts of alve effects of alveolar capillary membrane changes. 2. Ineffective airway clearance related to effects of infection, excessive tracheobronchial secretions. Fatigue and decreased energy chest discomfort and muscle weakness. A primary collaborative problem for the patient with pneumonia is potential for sepsis. Additional nursing diagnoses in, in collaboration, collaborative problems. In addition to the common nursing, nursing diagnoses and collaborative problems, the patient with pneumonia may have one or more of these. Acute pain related to effects of inflammation of parietal pleura uh, coughing, deficient fluid volume related to increased respiratory rate, fever, infection, increased metabolic rate, sleep deprivation related to pain, dyspnea, unfamiliar environment, and hospitalization, potential for pleural effusion. Planning and implementation. Knock planning expected outcomes. The patient with pneumonia is expected to have adequate gas exchange. Indications are indicators of adequate gas exchange are maintenance of SAO2 of at least 95% or in the patient's normal range. Absence of cyanosis. Maintenance of Cognitive orientation. Interventions. Interventions to manage the impaired gas exchange are similar to those for the patient, patient with chronic airflow limitation, or CAL. See chapter 32. In pneumonia, oxygen is the gas exchange uh, affected most. Therefore, hypo hypoxia hypoxemia sorry I'm falling asleep here therefore hypoxemia is the primary problem carbon dioxide retention is not common in pneumonia uh, nursing priorities include delivery of oxygen therapy and assisting the patient with the bronchial hygiene Oxygen therapy. Oxygen, oxygen therapy is usually delivered by nasal cannula or mask unless the hypoxemia does not improve with these dietary or sorry these delivery vices. I can't even read today. The patient who is confused may not tolerate a face mask. Check the skin under the device and under the elastic band, especially around the ears, for areas of redness or skin breakdown. Other NIC activities for oxygen therapy are listed in Chapter 33.6. Incentive spirometry, also known as a sustained maximal inspiration, is a type of bronchial hygiene used in pneumonia. The objective is to improve inspiratory muscle performance and to prevent or reverse atelectasis. Um, alveolar collapse. Uh, instruct the patient to exhale fully 
then place the mouthpiece in his or her mouth and then take a long slow breath uh, deep breath for, for three to five seconds evaluate technique and record the volume of air inspired teach the patient to perform five to ten breaths per session every hour while taking ineffective airway clearance planning expected outcomes the patient with pneumonia is expected to maintain a patent airway in uh, patent airway indicators are effective cough absence of pallor or cyanosis abs absence of crackles and wheezes on auscultation and pulse oximetry at or above 95 percent interventions Interventions for ineffective airway clearance for pneumonia are similar to those for COPD or asthma. Because of fatigue, muscle weakness, uh, chest discomfort, and excessive secretions, the patient with pneumonia often has difficulty clearing secretions. Help him or her cough and deep breathe at least every two hours. The alert patient may use an incentive spirometer to facilitate deep breathing and stimulate coughing. Chest physiotherapy or CPT, CPT or chest PT is no longer recommended for uncomplicated pneumonia. Dehydration should be avoided, but there is no evidence. but there is no evidence that hydration helps clear secretions. Encourage the alert patient to drink at least three liters of fluid daily unless another health problem requires fluid restriction. Adequate hydration may help thin secretions and make them easier to move. Monitor intake and output to ensure adequate hydration, especially when fever and tech tachypnea are present. Chart 33.6, Intervention Activities, the patient with pneumonia, oxygen therapy, <sighs> administration of oxygen and monitoring of its effectiveness, clear oral, nasal, and tracheal secretions as appro appropriate, restrict smoking, maintain airway patency, set up oxygen equipment and administer through a heated, humidified system. Monitor the ox oxygen leader flow. Monitor the position of oxygen delivery service. No, my God, I'm so sorry. I'm falling asleep here. Monitor the oxygen leader flow. Monitor position of oxygen delivery device. <laughs> Instruct patient about importance of leaving oxygen delivery device on. Periodically check oxygen delivery device to ensure that the prescribed concentration is being delivered. Monitor the effectiveness of oxygen therapy, e.g. pulse oximetry, ABGs, as appropriate. Assure replacement of oxygen mask slash cannula when the device is removed. Monitor patient's ability to tolerate removal of oxygen while eating. Uh, change oxygen delivery device from mask to nasal prongs during meals as tolerated. Monitor for signs of oxygen toxicity and absorption atelectasis. Monitor patient's anxiety related to need for oxygen. Monitor for skin breakdown from friction of oxygen device. Provide, the o provide for oxygen when patient is transported. The healthcare provider prescribes bronchodilators um, especially beta-2 agonists, uh, see chapter 32.5 and 30, 32.2, when uh, bronchospasm is part of the disease process. They are initially given by aerosol and nebulizer and then by metered dose inhaler. Inhaled steroids are used with acute pneumonia when, a, when the patient also has bronchial asthma or airway swelling. Potential for sepsis, knock, planning, expected outcome. 
The patient with pneumonia is expected to be free of the invading organism and to return to a pre-pneumonia health status. Indicators are absence of fever, absence of pathogens in blood and sputum, WC count, and different with and differential within normal limits. Interventions. The key to effective treatment of pneumonia is eradication of the organism causing the infection. Anti-infectives are given for all types of pneumonias, except those caused by viruses. The healthcare provider prescribes anti-infective agent er, therapy uh, based on whether the pneumonia is community-acquired CAP or hospital-acquired HAP. The exact drug or drugs, exact drug or drugs, and their routes of delivery are determined by the severity of infection, the organism, the organism suspected or identified, and whether the patient has other conditions or factors that increase the risk for complications. Total thirty-three four, uh, th thirty-three four lists recommended drugs for treatment of pneumonia. Although standard treatment protocols are recommended, drug therapy choices also reflect the degree of drug resistance in the specific geographic area and in the hospital setting. Recommended drug drugs for treatment of pneumonia in acute care case settings. Okay, there's amikacin or amikin, ampicillin or uh, slash sulbactam or unison, unison, um, azithromycin or zithromax or zmax, astrionam or azatacum or aztactam. Uh, Cephiroxime, cephirozime, or ceftin, kefirox, zinicef, uh, ethromycin, or emycin, uh, EES, many others. There's cefepime, or maxepime, uh, ceftriazone, or rocephin, uh, cephatozime, or uh, Clofor, clofuran, there's septazidime, or septaz, fortaz, tazacef, or tazidime, or ciproflexin, or siloxin, or cipro, ciproflexin, cipro, um, clindamycin, or cleosin, phosphate, or cleosin. There's clarithromycin or biaxin. There's diathromcin, th and that's di dynabac. There's doxycycline or adoxa, many others. There's gentamicin or garamicin. There's imipenem slash celastatin. Um, and that's premaxin. There's levofloax, uh, le levofloxacin, or um, iquix, or liquix, or leviquin, quixin. There's a linezolid, or zyvox. Zy There's meropenem, or merum. There's metronidazole. Or flagell, many others. There's moxifloxacin, <laughs> uh, or avalox, or vigamox. There's piperacillin, or uh, tazobactam, or zosin. There's tiacoplanin, or targacid. There's ticarcillin. Or slash clav clavulinate clavulinate. Uh, also, uh, and that's timotin and vancomycin or vancomycin 
That's uh, Venkison. So mostly antibiotics there, it looks like. If IV drugs are used, the patient may be able to be switched to care to oral therapy in two or three days, depending on the response, e.g. stable clinical condition at afebrile. The course of anti-infective therapy varies with the drug used in the organisms Excuse me, involved. Usually anti-infectives are used for five to seven days for immunocompromised patients or one with HAP. Wait, for five to seven days for a patient with uncomplicated CAP and up to 21 days for an immun immunocompromised patient or one with HAP. Drug resistance is becoming increasingly common, especially for infectious infections with streptococcus pneumoniae. This problem is known as drug resistance, known as drug resistant streptococcus pneumoniae, or DRSP. DRSP is most common among people older than 65 years and among those who became infected as a result of exposure uh, to a young ch to young children from a daycare environment. For pneumonia resulting from aspiration of food or stomach contents, interventions focus on preventing prevention of lung damage and treating the infection. Aspiration of acidic substances, e.g., vomitous stomach contents, can cause widespread inflammation leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome. ARDS and permanent lung damage. In these conditions, steroids and NSAIDs are used with antibiotics to reduce the inflammatory response. NCLEX examination challenge. The 82-year-old client with pneumonia has become increasingly confused and has SAO2 uh, his SAO2 has changed from 91% an hour ago to 88% now, and his respiratory rate has increased from 26 to 32. What is the nurse's first best action? A. Assist him to move more upright. B. Increase the flow rate on his IV piggyback antibiotic. C. Increase the, his O2 flow rate by 2 liters and reassess in 5 minutes. Or D. Call the rapid response team or his health care provider. I don't know. I think it's A, but we'll see. Community-based care. The patient needs to continue the anti-infective drugs as prescribed. An important nursing role is to reinforce, clarify, and provide information to the family and patient as indicated. Home care management. No special changes are needed in the home. If the home consists of more than one story, the patient may prefer to stay on one floor for a few weeks because stair climbing may increase fatigue and dyspnea. Bath and hygiene needs may be met by using a bedside commode if a bathroom, bathroom is not located on the level the patient is using. Home care needs de depend on the patient's level of fatigue dyspnea and family and social support. The long recovery phase of pneumonia, especially in the older patient, can be frustrating and perhaps depressing. Fatigue, weakness, and residual cough can last for weeks. Some patients fear they will never return to a normal level of functioning. It is important to prepare them for the course of the disease and to offer reassurance that complete recovery will occur. Early after discharge, a home health nurse assessment may be helpful. Chart 33.7. Health teaching. Health teaching. Re review all drugs with the patient and family and emphasize completing anti-infective therapy. Teach the patient to notify the health care provider if chills, fever, persistent cough, dyspnea, wheezing, hemoptysis, Increased sputum production, chest discomfort, or increasing fatigue recurs if symptoms fail to resolve. 
Uh, stress the importance of getting plenty of rest and gradually increasing exercise. Chart 33.7, Focused Assessment, the patient recovering from pneumonia. Ask whether the patient has had any of these. New onset confusion, chills, fever, persistent cough, dyspnea, wheezing, hemoptysis, um, increased sputum production, chest discomfort, increased fatigue, any other symptoms that have failed to resolve. Assess the patient for fever, diaphoresis, cyanosis, especially around the mouth or conjunctiva, uh, dyspnea, tachypnea, or tachycardia, adventitious or abnormal breath sounds, weakness. An important aspect of education for the patient and family is the avoidance of upper respiratory tract infections and viruses. Teach him or her to avoid crowds, especially in the fall and winter when viruses are prevalent people who have a cold or flu and exposure to irritants such as smoke. Stress the importance of following his or her health care provider's recommendations for vaccination against influenza and pneumonia. A balanced diet and adequate fluid intake are essential. Health care resources. Inform patients who smoke that smoking is a risk factor for pneumonia. Provide them with information on smoking cessation classes through the American Lung Association and American Cancer Society. The healthcare provider may prescribe nicotine patches, warn the patient of the danger of myocardial infarction if smoking is continued while using the patches, urge him or her to enroll in a smoking cessation program to assist in the nicotine withdrawal process in conjunction with the nicotine patches, provide information booklets on pneumonia provided by the ALA, urge the patient who has not already been vaccinated against influenza or pneumonia to take this preventative measure when the pneumonia has resolved. Evaluation Outcomes Evaluate the care of the patient with pneumonia on the basis of the identified nursing diagnoses and collaborative problems. The expected outcomes are that he or she attains or maintains adequate gas exchange, maintains patent airways, is free of the invading organism, returns to his or her pre-pneumonia health status. Uh, specific indicators for these outcomes are listed for each nursing diagnosis and collaborative problem under the planning and implementation section see earlier okay and that is pneumonia all right Iggy 677 to 684 PE pulmonary embolism an acute injury or problem that results in severe respiratory impairment can occur at any age. Older adults, however, are more at risk for developing critical respiratory problems. The patient who is short of breath is also anxious and fearful. Be prepared to manage both the physical and emotional needs of the patient during any respiratory emergency. Pulmonary Embolism Pathophysiology A pulmonary embolism, PE, is a collection of particular particulate matter or solid, solids, liquids, or air that enters venous circulation and lodges in the pulmonary vessels. Large emboli obstruct pulmonary blood flow, leading to reduced oxygenation of the whole body. Pulmonary tissue hypoxia and, pulmonary tissue hypoxia and potential death. Any substance can cause an embolism, but a blood clot is the most common. PE is common it is common and many patients die within one hour of the onset of symptoms or before the diagnosis has even been suspected a PE is the most a, a PE is the most common acute pulmonary disease among hospitalized patients in most people with PE a blood clot from a deep vein thrombosis or DVT breaks loose from one of the veins in the legs or in the pelvis. The clot breaks off, travels through the vena cava into the right side of the heart, and then lodges in the pulmonary artery or one or more of its branches. Platelets collect on the embolus, triggering the release of substances that cause blood vessel constriction. Widespread pulmonary vessel constriction and pulmonary hypertension impair gas exchange. Deoxygenated blood is moved into the arterial circulation causing hypoxemia, low arterial blood oxygen level. 
although some patients with PE do not have hypoxemia. Major risk factors for DVT leading to PE are prolonged immobility, central venous catheters, surgery, obesity, advancing age, conditions that increase blood clotting, history of thromboembolism. In addition, smoking, pregnancy, estrogen therapy, estrogen therapy, heart failure, stroke, cancer, particularly lung or prostate, Trousseau syndrome, and trauma increase the risk of DVT and PE. Fat, oil, air, tumor cells, amniotic fluid, foreign objects, e.g. broken IV catheters, injected particles, and infected clots or pus can enter a vein and cause PE. Fat emboli from fracture of a long bone and oil emboli from diagnostic procedures do not impede blood flow in the lungs. Instead, they cause blood vessel injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS, A-R-D-S. Amniotic fluid embolus has a high mortality rate and occurs as a rare complication of childbirth, abortion, or amniocentesis. Septic clots emboli often arise from a pelvic abscess, an infected IV catheter, and non-sterile injections of illegal drugs. With septic clots, the toxic effects of the infection are more serious than the venous blockage. Health Promotion and Maintenance Although pulmonary embolism PE, can occur in healthy people and may give no warning, it occurs more often in some situations. Thus, prevention of conditions that lead to PE is a major nursing concern. Preventative actions for PE are those that also prevent venous stasis and DVT. Best practices for PE prevention are outlined in Chart 34.1. Lifestyle changes can help reduce the risk for PE. Urge patients to stop smoking cigarettes, especially women who take oral contraceptives. Reducing weight and becoming more physically active, such as walking one or more miles each day, can reduce risks for PE. Teach patients who are traveling for long periods to drink plenty of water, change, posi change positions often, avoid crossing the legs, and get up from the sitting position at least five minutes out of every hour. Actions to prevent DVT and PE after surgery are described in Chapters 16 and 18. For patients known to be at risk for PE, small doses of heparin or a similar drug may be prescribed every 8 to 12 hours. Heparin prevents excessive clotting in patients after trauma or surgery, or when restricted to bed rest. Occasionally, a drug t to reduce platelet aggregation, such as clopidogrel or Plavix, is used in place of uh, heparin. Thir chart 34.1, Best Practice for safe Patient Safety and Quality Care. Prevention of Pulmonary Embolism. Start passive and active range of motion exercises for the extremities of immobil immobilized and post-operative patients. Ambulate patients soon after surgery. Use anti-embolism and pneumatic compression stockings and devices after surgery. Avoid the use of, of tight garters, girdles, and constricting clothing. Prevent pressure under the popliteal space, e.g. with a pillow. Perform a comprehensive assessment of peripheral circulation. Evaluate the effect the affected limb 20 degrees evaluate elevate the affected limb 20 degrees or more above the level of the heart to improve venous return as appropriate change patient position every two hours or ambulate as tolerated prevent injury to the vessel lumen by preventing local pressure trauma infection or sepsis refrain from massaging or compressing leg muscles instruct patient not to cross legs Administer prophylactic low-dose anticoagulant and antiplatelet drugs. Teach the patient to avoid activities that result in the Valsalva maneuver. Administer drugs that will prevent uh, episodes of the Valsalva maneuver as appropriate. Laxative. Teach the patient and family about precautions and uh, encourage smoking cessation. Patient-Centered Collaborative Care Assessment History
history, history, history. Yes. Uh, assess any patient with sudden onset of breathing difficulty about the risk factors for PE, especially a history of DVT, recent surgery, or prolonged immobility. Physical assessment slash clinical manifestations. Respiratory manifestations are outlined in chart 34.2. Assess the patient for difficulty breathing, dyspnea, occurring with a rapid heart rate and pleuritic chest pain, sharp stabbing type pain in, on inspiration. These symptoms are found in most patients who have PE, stabbing sharp pain in the pleural, pleuritic chest area. Okay, uh, other symptoms vary depending on the size and the type of embolism. Breaths, breath sounds may be normal may be normal but crackles usually occur. Often a dry cough is present. Hemoptysis or bloody sputum may result from pulmonary infarction. Cardiac manifestations include distended neck veins or synco syncope, uh, fainting or, uh, or loss of consciousness, cyanosis, and hypotension. Assess for this symptom cluster and, if present, notify the rapid response team. So, fainting, distant, fat neck veins, uh, sign blueness, and low blood pressure. Hypotension during massive emboli results from acute pulmonary hypertension and, and reduces forward blood flow. Often abnormal heart sounds such as an S3 or S4 occur. Electrocardiogram findings are abnormal, nonspecific and transient. T wave and T ST segment changes occur in many patients. Left axis or right axis deviations are also common. Miscellaneous manifestations uh, can, all, can include a low grade fever and petechiae on the skin over the chest and in the axilla. Some patients have more vague symptoms resembling the flu, such as nausea, vomiting, and general malaise. Psychosocial assessment. The onset of symptoms is usually abrupt, making the patient with PE anxious and fearful. Hypoxemia may cause the patient to have a sense of impending doom and increased restlessness. The emergency nature of the disorder and admission to an intensive care unit, ICU, increase the patient's anxiety and fear of death. Chart 34.2, Key Features, Pulmonary Embolism, Symptoms, Dyspnea, Sudden Onset, Pleuritic, <laughs> Pleuritic Chest Pain, Apprehension, Restlessness, Feeling of Impending Doom, Cough, Hemoptysis. Signs, tachypnea, crackles, pleural friction rub, tachycardia, S3 and S4 heart sounds, diaphoresis, fever, low grade, petechiae over chest and axilla, and uh, decreased arterial oxygen saturation, SAO2. Okay. BTW petechiae is little red spots uh, uh, right on the very surface of the skin having to do with little tiny hemorrhages. Okay, laboratory assessment. The, hyperventilated, the hyperventilation triggered by hypoxia and pain first leads to respiratory alkalosis indicated by low partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide values on uh, ABG analysis. The alveolar arterial or A, uh, or capital A uh, uh, hyphen little a gradient is increased. The friendlier in quotations PaO2 uh, hyphen PhO2 or fraction of inspired oxygen ratio is commonly used to assess shunt because it does not require use of the complex AA gradient for formula. As blood is shunted without picking up oxygen from the lungs, the PaCO2 level starts to rise, resulting in re respiratory acidosis. 
Later, a metabolic acidosis results from buildup of lactic lactic acid. Okay, later, metabolic acidosis results from buildup of lactic acid due to tissue hypoxia. See Chapter 14 for a more detailed discussion of acidosis. Even if ABG studies and pulse oximetry show hypoxemia, these results alone are not sufficient for the diagnosis of PE. A patient with a small embolus may not be hypoxemic, and PE is not the only cause of hypoxemia. Imaging assessment. A chest x-ray may show a PE if it is large. Some large infiltration may be present around the embolism site. However, the chest x-ray may not show any acute changes. Uh, spiral computer uh, tomography or CT scans are most often used to diagnose PE. The physician may perform transesophageal echocardiogram or TEE. See chapter 35. Mm -hmm. To help detect PE, Doppler ultrasound studies or impedance plethysmography or IPG may be used to document the presence of DVT and to support a and to support a diagnosis of PE. Decision making challenge. Critical rescue. You are assigned to care for a 60-year-old woman who is in the medical intensive care unit, the MICU, for community-acquired pneumonia requ requiring mechanical ventilation. She is a one-pack-per-day smoker and does not use alcohol or recreational drugs. Before admission, she had several days with shortness of breath, SOB, a productive cough, and generalized fatigue. While in the MICU, she was on st strict bed rest because if mechanical ventil ventilatory support, because of mechanical ventilatory support. Her drugs include uh, erythromycin for community-acquired pneumonia, hydromorphone, dilated as needed for pain, and Tylenol, as needed for fever. Two hours ago, she was extubated and the mechanical ventilation was discontinued. As you begin your monitoring physical, your morning physical assessment, you notice that she is agitated, confused, and tachycardic, and has technip, tachypnea, breathing, um, at 35 times per minute. Her oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry is 86%. What should be your first action? What risk factors does she have for pulmonary embolism? For what other manifestations should you assess? Is oxygen by mask appropriate for this patient? Why or why not? What other actions should you take? I don't know any of those answers. Whew. Analysis. Common nursing diagnoses and collaborative problems. The primary collaborative problem for patients with PE is hypoxemia. Priority Priority nursing diagnoses for patients with PE are 1. Decreased cardiac output related to acute pulmonary hypertension. 2. Anxiety related to hypoxemia and life-threatening illness. The secondary collaborative problem is potential for bleeding. Additional nursing diagnoses and collaborative problems. In addition to common nursing diagnoses and collaborative problems, patients with PE may have one or two, one or more of these. Uh, impaired gas exchange related to disrupted pulmonary perfusion and increased dead space. Fatigue related to hypoxemia. Impaired oral mucosa, mucous membrane related to oxygen therapy. Acute confusion related to hypoxemia. Sleep deprivation related to the ICU environment. Planning and Implementation Hypoxemia When a patient has a sudden onset of dyspnea and chest pain, immediately notify the rapid response team. Reassure the patient and assist him or her to a, a position of uh, comfort with the head of the bed elevated. Prepare for oxygen therapy and blood gas analysis while continuing to monitor and assess for other changes. Knock Planning Expected Outcomes the patient with PE is expected to have adequate tissue perfusion in all major organs. Indicators of adequate perfusion are ABGs within normal limits, pulse oximetry above 95%,
cognitive status not compromised, and absence of pallo or cyanosis. Interventions. Non-surgical management of PE is most common. In some cases, surgery may be needed in addition to drug therapy. Selected NIC interventions activities for the patient uh, with PE are listed in chart 34.3. Non-surgical management. Goals of management for PE are to increase gas exchange, improve lung perfusion, reduce risk for further clot formation, and prevent complications. Priority nursing interventions include implementing oxygen therapy, administering anticoagulation or fib fibrinolytic therapy. So priority is administering oxygen, then administering anticoagulation or fibrinolytic therapy. Um, monitoring the patient's response to the interventions and providing psychosocial support. Chart 34.3 NIC Intervention Activities The patient with pulmonary embolism. Embolus care. Pulmonary pulmonary um, limitations of complications for a patient experiencing or at risk for occlusion of pulmonary circulation. Evaluate chest pain e.g. Uh, intensity, location, radiation, duration, and precipitating and alleviating factors. Auscultate lung sounds for crackles or other adventitious sounds. Monitor respiratory pattern for symptoms of respiratory difficulty, e.g. dyspnea, tachypnea, and shortness of breath. Monitor der uh, determinants of tissue oxygen delivery, e.g. PaO2, SaO2, and hemoglobin levels and cardiac output, if available. Monitor for symptoms of inadequate tissue oxygenation, e.g. pallor, cyanosis, and sluggish capillary refill. Encourage good ventilation, e.g. incentive spirometer and cough and deep breathe every two hours. Instruct the patient and or family regarding diagnostic procedures as appropriate. Monitor side effects of anticoagulant medications, if appropriate. Uh, PaCO2 or PACO2, yeah, partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide, and PaO2, um, partial pressure of, of arterial oxygen, SaO2, or, oh, that's just telling me, that's just, those are just notes, okay. Back to the text, oxygen therapy is important for the patient with PE. The severely hypoxemic patient may need mechanical ventilation and close monitoring with ABG studies. In less severe cases, oxygen may be applied by nasal cannula or mask. Use pulse oximetry to monitor oxygen saturation and determine the degree of hypoxemia. Monitor the patient f continually for any changes uh, in status. Check vital signs, lung sounds, and cardiac and respiratory status at least every one to two hours. Document increasing dyspnea and dysrhythmias distended neck veins, and pedal and sacral edema. Assess for crackles and other abnormal lung sounds along with cyanosis of the lips, conjunctiva, oral mucosa, and uh, nail beds. Drug therapy with anticoagulants may be prescribed to keep the embolus from enlarging and to prevent the formation of any new clots. Active bleeding, stroke, and recent trauma are reasons, reasons to avoid this therapy before proceeding, each patient is evaluated to determine the risk versus the benefit of anticoagulant therapy. Heparin is usually used unless the PE is massive or occurs with hemodynamic instability. A fibrinolytic drug may then be used to break up the existing clot. Uh, review the patient's partial thromboplastin time, PTT, uh, also called activated partial thromboplastin time, APTT, before therapy is started every four hours when therapy begins and daily thereafter. Therapeutic PTT values usually range between 1.5 and 2.5 times the control value for this problem. Some fibrinolytic, fibrinolytic drugs such as Altaplace or Activase TPA are used for treatment of PE. Specific criteria for use of these drugs are massive PE, uh, those that obstruct blood flow to a lobe or more than one segment, and emboli that induce hemodynamic instability, 
That includes failure to maintain blood pressure without supportive measures. Heparin therapy usually continues for 5 to 10 days. Most patients are started on an oral anticoagulant such as warfarin coumadin on the third day of heparin use. Therapy with both heparin and warfarin continues until the patient has an international normalized ratio INR of 2 to 3. To facilitate early discharge, a low molecular weight heparin, e.g. daltaparin or ano, uh, anoxaparin, lo lovinox, is often used along with the warfarin. Monitor the INR daily. Warfarin use, use continues for three to six weeks, but some patients at high risk may take warfarin indefinitely. Charts 34 to 4 and th or 34 4 and 34 5 list common drugs used and which laboratory tests to monitor. These drugs and their associated nursing care are discussed also in chapters 38, 40, and 41. Anticoagulation and fibrinolytic therapy can lead to excessive bleeding. In addition, even when clots, clotting times are in the desired ranges, the patient may develop another problem that requires invasive therapy and a return to more normal coagulation responses. Thus, it is critical to keep antidotes to anticoagulant drugs on the unit for patients undergoing this therapy. The antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate. The antidote for warfarin is injectable phytotonidinolabath, phyto, phytonidine, vitamin K1, aquamephitone, mephitone, mephitone, vitamin K. Antidotes for fibrinolytic therapy include clotting factors, fresh frozen plasma, and amniocaproic acid, or amicar. That's, those are antidotes for TPA. Um, chart 344, common examples of drug therapy, pulmonary embolism. Um, drug and usual usage, heparin sodium. Uh, 5,000 to 10,000 units IV push initially, then dose adjustment is based on PTT, 1,300 units an hour on continuous drip or less, preferably intermittent infu in infusion. Purpose, to begin anticoagulation to minimize growth of existing clots and to prevent the development of additional clots. And nursing interventions uh, related would be monitor PTT and no expected therapeutic PTT range for each patient. Report PTT results, monitor patient for bleeding or bruising, rebolus every time infusion is increased, do not use with salicylates, monitor platelets daily for thrombocytopenia, uh, have the antidote protamine sulfate available, avoid puncture sites and apply pressure to venipuncture and IM injection sites, avoid use of firm toothbrushes, straight razors, and rectal thermometers. And rationales for those would be ongoing assessment helps detect side effects and prevent complications. Reporting and monitoring enable the physician to begin early treatment of a prolonged PTT and excessive bleeding uh, to maintain anticoagulation within consistent therapeutic levels. Uh, that would be for the protamine sulfate. Or, no, I don't know. An increased anticoagulation effect can occur with salicylates. Uh, and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT, uh, a type of arterial thrombosis can occur. Um, being prepared for an emergency helps prevent further complications. Pressure at puncture sites helps promote clotting, and safety measures help prevent bleeding. Okay, then there's anoxaparin, or uh, lovinox. 1 milligram per kilogram subcutaneous every 12 hours. Uh, this will uh, purpose to allow for hospital discharge before complete switch to oral anticoagulants. Um, nursing interventions, same as heparin. Um, rationale is also the same. There is a med alert on Lovinox. Uh, it can be given only subcutaneously, not intravenously or intramuscularly. Next, warfarin, sodium, coumadin, warfarin. 
I wore for loan. Okay, um, to allow for long term anticoagulation in at risk patients to prevent the development of future clots. Interventions monitor INR and know expected therapeutic INR range for each patient. Report INR results. Monitor the patient for bleeding or bruising. Monitor for fever and skin rash. Consult the pharmacist about potential drug interactions. Have the antidote vitamin K available. Apply pressure to venipuncture and IM injection sites. Avoid use of firm toothbrushes, straight razors, and rectal thermometers. Teach the patient uh, which foods are high in vitamin K. Um... There was some more on warfarin, 10 to 15 milligrams orally for three days initially, then dose adjustment is based on INR, usually 5 to 10 milligrams orally daily, now available as a parenteral drug for use in hospitalized patients. Dosage is the same as with the oral form of the drug, and then I'll just read kind of rationales and contra or adverse stuff. Ongoing assessment helps detect side effects and prevent complication. Reporting enables the physician to, reporting INR, uh, reporting enables the physician to begin early treatment of prolonged INR. Um, adverse drug reaction can occur, having to do with fever and skin rash. There are many drug interactions with warfarin, uh, cons having to do with consult the pharmacist for potential drug actions. Being prepared for an emer emergency helps prevent complications, having to do with vitamin K, pressure, a puncture sites promotes clotting, safety measures help prevent bleeding, food sources of vitamin K will alter the INR. So PTT for Coumadin and INR for Warfarin. Alteplase, tissue plasminogen activator recombinant, TPA or Activase. 100 milligrams IV infusion over two hours. Uh, it's promote, this is to promote lysis of a large pulmonary emboli in those patients who are hemodynamically unstable. Um, you want to assess for internal and external bleeding, reconstitu reconstitute with sterile water without preservative immediately before use, administer with caution to patients who have been receiving aspirin, uh, dipridol, or dipridamol, uh, heparin, or other anticoagulants. Bleeding is the most common adverse effect. Recommended preparation ensures drug stability and other drugs with anticoagulation effects increase the risk of bleeding. Chart 34.5, laboratory profile. Blood tests used to monitor anticoagulation therapy. Partial thro thromboplastin time, PTT, APTT, APTT. Normal range. Normal values of each local laboratory may vary. Um, when activated reagents are used by the laboratory, the normal clotting time is shortened. Um, significance of abnormal findings. I'll just go down the normal range first. Common normal ranges are 20 to 30 seconds in some laboratories and 30 to 40 seconds in others. Therapeutic range for PE is 1.5 to 2.5 times the normal value of that particular person. E.g., if normal is 20 to 30 seconds, then therapeutic range is 40 to 75. Then under significance of abnormal findings, subtherapeutic times may uh, so low times may signify that a patient is not receiving enough heparin to prevent extension of the blood clot an increase in the dosage or rate of infusion is usually indicated therapeutic times mean that the clotting time is increased from normal but it, this increase is indicative in is indicated in the case of PE um, prolonged times in the patient with PE would be greater than 75 seconds this indicates that the patient is at risk of serious spontaneous bleeding. Heparin is usually held or decreased until the PTT drops back into the therapeutic range. Okay, prothrombin time, or pro time, PT, just PT, 11 to 12.5 seconds. 
therapeutic range for anticoagulant therapy in PE is 1.5 to 2 times the normal or control value in seconds. Control values can vary day to day because reagents used may vary. If INR values are reported with the PT, therapeutic range for PE is 2.5 to 3.0 or 3.0 to 4.5 for recurrent PE. Subtherapeutic values may signify that the patient is not receiving enough warfarin and increase in the dosage is usually uh, indicated. Yeah, so we're talking about warfarin now. Okay. Um, therapeutic value means that the pro time is increased from normal, but this increase is indicated in the case of PE. Same as before. And prolonged values in the treatment of PE indicate that the patient is at risk for bleeding. The warfarin dose is usually de decreased or held. The patient is instructed to eat foods high in vitamin K or an injection of vitamin K may be given if it's prolonged values too high. Surgical management. Two surgical procedures for the management of PE are embolectomy and inferior, inferior vena cava interruption. Embolectomy is the surgical removal of the embolus from the pulmonary blood vessels. It may be performed when fibrinolytic therapy cannot be used for a patient who has massive or multiple large pulmonary emboli with shock. Special thromboectomy catheters that can mechanically break up clots, such as the angiojet, allow quick and effective reduction of clots with or without the use of thrombolytic drugs. Inferior vena cava. Um, inferior vena cava interruption with placement of a vena cava filter is a life-saving measure by preventing further embolus formation for some patients. Now that some of these filters are removable, the filter can be placed before symptoms uh, develop in patients. Uh, develop in patients who are at high risk for clots such as those who must remain on prolonged bed rest because of illness or injury. These filters can be removed when the risk for clot formation decreases, or they can be left in place permanently. Patients for whom filter, for whom filter placement is considered less risky than drug therapy include those with recurrent or major bleeding while receiving anticoagulants, those with septic PE, and those undergoing pulmonary uh, embolectomy. Uh, placement of a vena cava filter is de detailed in chapter 38. Decreased cardiac output, NOC, planning expected outcomes. The patient with PE is expected to have adequate circulation. Indicators of adequate circulation are maintenance of pulse rate and blood pressure within the normal ranges, maintenance of a urine output of at least 30 mils an hour, absence of cyanosis. Interventions. In addition to the interventions used for hypoxema, hypoxemia, IV fluid therapy and drug therapy are used to increase cardiac output. IV fluid therapy involves you giving crystalloid solutions to restore plasma volume and prevent shock. See chapter 39. Continuously monitor the electrocardiogram or ECG and pulmonary artery and central venous right atrial pressures of the patient receiving IV fluids because increased fluids can worsen pulmonary hypertension and lead to right sided heart failure. drug therapy with agents drug therapy with agents that increase myocardial contractility positive enotropic agents may be prescribed when IV therapy alone does not improve cardiac output common drugs include milrinone or primacor and dobutamine or dobutrex assess the patient's cardiac status hourly during therapy during therapy with inotropic drugs, vasodilators such as nitroprusside or nipride or nitropress may be used to decrease pulmonary artery pressure if it is 
impeding cardiac contractility. Anxiety, planning, out, expected outcomes. The patient with PE is expected to have a reduction in the level of anxiety. Indicators include that he or she consistently demonstrates these behaviors. Statement that anxiety is reduced. Absence of distress, irritability, and facial tension. Effective use of coping strategies. Interventions. The patient with PE is anxious and fearful for many reasons. Interventions for reducing anxiety in those with PE include oxygen therapy, see interventions on page 680 in the hypoxemia section, uh, communication and drug therapy. Communication is critical in allaying anxiety. Acknowledge the anxiety and the patient's perception of a life-threatening situation. Stay with him or her and speak calmly and clearly, providing assurance that appropriate measures are are being taken when giving drugs changing places changing positions taking vital signs or assisting the patient explain the rationale and share information drug therapy with an anti-anxiety drug may be prescribed if the patient's anxiety increases or prevents adequate rest unless he or she is intubated and me mechanically ventilated agents that have a sedating effect are avoided. Potential for bleeding, not planning expected outcomes. The patient with PE is expected to remain free from bleeding. Indicators are absence of bruising or petechiae, uh, maintenance of hematocrit and hemoglobin within the normal range. Out expected outcomes. Interventions. As a result of drug therapy that disrupts clots or prevents their formation, the patient's ability to stop and continue the blood clotting cascade when injured is seriously impaired and the risk for bleeding is high. Priority nursing objectives are ensuring that appropriate antidotes are present on the nursing, uh, on the nursing unit, protecting the patient from situations that could lead to bleeding and monitoring closely the amount of bleeding that is occurring. Assess at least every two hours for evidence of bleeding in the form of oozing, bruises that cluster, petechiae, or purpura, purpura. I don't know what purpura is, but I bet you it's purple. Examine all stools, urine, drainage, and vomitus visually for gross blood. Ooh, gross. And test for occult blood. What about Frank blood? Measure any blood loss as accurately as possible. Measure the patient's abdominal girth every eight hours. Increases in abdominal girth can indicate internal bleeding. Best practices to prevent bleeding are outlined in Chapter 34.6. Monitor laboratory values daily. Review the complete blood count, CBC, results to determine the patient's risk for bleeding and whether actual blood loss has occurred. If the patient has severe blood loss, packed red blood cells may be prescribed. See the discussion of transfusion therapy in Chapter 42. Monitor the platelet count. A decreasing count uh, may indicate ongoing clotting or development of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT caused by the formation of anti-heparin antibodies. NCLEX examination challenge. The client recovering from a PE is receiving a continuous infusion of heparin IV. When the nurse comes to take vital signs, the client has blood on his pajama jacket and pillow. He is pinching his nose to control a nosebleed. What is the nurse's best first action? A. Prepare to administer potamine sulfate parentarily. B. Prepare to administer phytonidine parentinarily. Excuse me. Call the physician or rapid response team. Or slow the IV and assess the bleeding. I think it's D. But whatever. <coughs> hmm. 
Community-based care. The patient with the PE is discharged when hypoxemia and hemodynamic instability have been resolved and adequate anticoagulation has been achieved. Anticoagulation therapy usually conti continues after discharge. Home care management. Some patients are d discharged to home with minimal risk for recurrence and no permanent physiologic changes. Others may have extensive heart or lung damage and need to modify their homes and lifestyles. Chart 34.6, best practice for patient safety and quality care. Prevention of injury for the patient receiving anticoagulant or fibrinolytic therapy. Handle the patient gently. Use and teach UAP to use a lift sheet when uh, our unlicensed personnel, assisted personnel, uh, to use a lift sheet when moving and positioning the patient in bed. Avoid uh, IM injections and venipunctures. When injections or venipunctures are necessary, use the smallest gauge needle for the task. Apply firm pressure to the needle stick site for 10 minutes or until the site no longer oozes blood. Apply ice to areas of, tr of trauma. Test all urine, vomitus, and stool for the presence of occult blood. Uh, observe four sites every four hours. Or, sorry, obse observe IV sites oh, Lord. every four hours for bleeding. Instruct a uh, instruct alert patients to notify nursing personnel immediately if any trauma occurs and if bleeding or bruising is noticed. Avoid trauma to rectal tissues. Instruct unlicensed personnel not to take temperatures rectally, even on unconscious patients. Do not administer enemas. If suppositories are prescribed, lubricate liberally and administer with caution. Instruct the patient and unlicensed personnel to use an electric shaver rather than a razor when providing mouth care of supervise or supervising others in pr providing mouth care. Use a soft bristle toothbrush or tooth sponge. Do not use floss. Check to make sh certain the dentures fit and do not rub. Instruct the patient not to blow the nose forcefully or insert objects into the nose, like your finger. Instruct uh, unlicensed personnel and the patient to wear shoes with firm soles whenever the patient is ambulating. Ensure that an antidotes to anticoagulation therapy are on the unit. Patients with extensive lung damage may have activity intolerance and become fatigued easily. The living arrangements may need to be modified so that patients can spend all or most of the time on one floor and avoid climbing stairs. Depending on the degree of impairment, patients may require some or, or much assistance with ADLs. Health Teaching patient with a PE may continue anticoagulation therapy, therapy for weeks, months, or years after discharge, depending on, the risk, depending on the risks for PE. Teach him or her and the family about bleeding precautions, activities to reduce the risks for deep vein thrombosis, DVT, and recurrence of PE, complications, and the need for follow-up care, Chapter 34-7. Healthcare resources. Patients using anticoagulation therapy are usually seen in a clinic or healthcare provider's office weekly for blood drawing and assessment. Those who are homebound may have a visit from a home care nurse to perform these actions. See chart 348 for a focused assessment guide. Patients with severe dyspnea may need home oxygen therapy. Respiratory therapy treatments can be performed in the home. The nurse or case manager coordinates arrangements for oxygen and other respiratory therapy to be avail available if needed at home. Chart 34.8 Home Care Assessment The Patient After Pulmonary Embolism 
Assess respiratory status, observe rate and depth of ventilation, auscultate lungs, um, examine nail beds and mu mucous membranes for evidence of cyanosis. Take a pulse oximetry reading. Ask the patient if chest pain or shortness of breath is experienced in any position. In any position. Ask the patient about the presence of sputum and its color and character. Assess cardiovascular status. Take vital signs, including apical pulse, pulse pressure. Assess, uh, assess for presence or absence of orthostatic hypotension and quality and rhythm of peripheral pulses. Note presence or absence of peripheral edema. Examine hard vein filling in the dependent position. Uh, examine neck vein filling in the recumbent and sitting position. Okay. Um, assess lower extremities for deep vein thrombosis. Examine lower legs and compare with each other for general edema, calf swelling, surface temperature, presence of red streaks or cord-like palpable structure. Um, measure calf circumference. Ask the patient to dorsiflex and plantarflex each foot. Note the ease with which the patient can do this and ask whether pain is experienced in either position. Gently squeeze the calf of each leg laterally and from front to back. Ask the patient where, whether the pain or tenderness is experienced with each maneuver. Assess for evidence of bleeding. Examine the mouth and gums for oozing or frank bleeding. Um, examine all skin areas for bruising or peteche. If the patient voids during the visit, test the urine for cult, cult blood. Assess cognition and mental status, level of consciousness, orientation to time, place, and person. Can the patient accurately read a seven word sentence containing no words with more than three syllables? Assess the patient's understanding of illness and adherence to treatment. Manifestations to report to health care provider. Uh, med medication plan, correct timing and dose. Bleeding precautions and prevention of deep vein thrombosis. Chart 34-7, Patient and Family Education Guide, Preventing Injury and Bleeding. During the, during the time you are taking anticoagulants, use an electric shaver, use soft bristle toothbrush, and do not floss. Do not have dental work performed without consulting your health care provider. Do not take aspirin or any aspirin-containing products. Read the label to be sure that the product does not contain aspirin or salicylates. Do not participate in contact sports or any activities likely to result in your being bumped, scratched, or scraped. If you are bumped, apply ice to the site for at least one hour. Avoid hard foods that would scrape the inside of your mouth. Eat warm, cool, or cold foods to avoid burning your mouth. Check your skin and mouth daily for bruising, swelling, or areas with small reddish-purple marks that may ind indicate bleeding. Notify your health care provider if you are injured and, persis and persistent. Bleeding results have excessive menstrual bleeding, see blood in your urine or bowel movement, avoid anal intercourse, take a stool softener to prevent straining during a bowel movement, do not use enemas or rectal suppositories, do not wear clothing or shoes that are tight or that rub. Avoid blowing your nose forcefully or placing objects in your nose. If you must blow your nose, do so gently without blocking either nasal passage. Avoid playing musical instruments that raise the pressure inside your head, such as brass wind instruments and wood, woodwinds or reed instruments. Keep all appointments for laboratory tests. Decision-making challenge, coordination of care. The patient described on page 679 with a PE is going home. She will continue warfarin therapy for at least one month. 1. What will you tell this patient about warfarin therapy? 2. Is she still at risk for PE? Why or why not? 3. What should you teach her to help reduce her risk for PE? Evaluation Outcomes 
evaluate the care of the patient with PE on the basis of the identified nurses, nursing diagnosis and collaborative problems. The expected outcomes are that he or she attains and maintains adequate gas, ex gas exchange and oxygen, does not experience hypovolemia and shock, uh, remains free from bleeding episodes, uh, states that levels of anxiety are reduced, uses effective coping strategies. Specific indicators for these outcomes are listed for each nursing uh, diagnosis and collaborative problem under the planning and implementation section C earlier. And that was PE.